think that this is a very important occasion because it's an occasion where we are discussing the lives of the people of Ghana as it is today and how it will span out in the next medium to long term. But it is also very important because the budget is the catalyst for everything we will do for the rest of the year. And so when we read the budget and we are discussing and debating the budget, we do so because the budget contains elements that focus, one, on the microeconomy. And the microeconomy talks about you, it talks about the businessman, and it talks about the households. But because we cannot individually measure all this, we must aggregate them into what we call the macroeconomy. And so whatever you and I are doing and earning our income and being paid our salaries will all be put together to be called the gross domestic product. What that means is that it is you, the individual, that is the driver of the bigger picture. And so if you are not properly taken care of, then chances are that the bigger picture will reflect the miserable life of the individuals. So when they come talking to you about interest rates or other price dynamics like inflation, the very best question you ask is, how does that reflect in the life of the ordinary Ghanaian who is the driver of these policies? We are where we are today because, unfortunately, we handed over power to a group of people who have chosen not to manage the economy for five years. A group of people who have specialized in using PR and managing narrative in order to enforce a certain belief system on us, even if they do not exist. A group of people who have been concentrated on always making us believe that the economy is rosy, even when we get home and we can't find a meal, they still tell us the economy is the best. So five years of non-management of the economy and the management of narrative that they want the people of Ghana to believe has led us to a point where we have no return and we must begin to confront the issues as we find them. I've always said that these people were very, very lucky because they are the very good friends of COVID-19. COVID-19 actually rescued these people better than it damaged Ghanaians. And all the indicators reflect the fact that by 2019, Ghana was headed in the very wrong direction and that it was becoming almost impossible to deal with the propaganda and to deal with the PR because the truth would expose you. We have had several years where we believed that somehow or another, there was somebody that was behind His Excellency Nanado Dankwa Kufato that had the magic wand. And that this person knew economics and the economy so well because when he was taught economics at what level, the only teacher and lecturer who taught him died and didn't get the opportunity to teach anybody again economics. And so he was the repository of economics. And those of you who recall my comments during the first budget of the MPP in 2017, I had told them that you cannot use the basic principle of Ceteris Parabus to run the Ghanaian economy. Because the Ghanaian economy is an economy that has very complex and technical, institutional, and structural rigidities that must be addressed in order to unleash the potential that the certain principles that we're espousing can work. And I warn them that they can be forgiven for delivering propaganda lectures. In fact, they can be forgiven by allowing propaganda lectures to become their manifesto promise to the people of Ghana. But once they ventured into implementing propaganda lectures as policies that they needed to implement, implementation was going to expose them. Today, we have seen that propaganda lectures can be delivered by anybody. But we have realized that implementing policy is a lot more difficult because they deal with the realities of life. You cannot be experimenting with the lives of the people. We have come to this point also because we have had almost four or five years where we did not believe that the budget is the budget of the people. His Excellency the President has been appointed or has been elected as the President to be given the power to seek our mandate to collect monies from us 
and for us to determine and approve where he will spend those monies. And so the budget that he presents to us is our budget. And that is why there are elaborate processes of consultations and stakeholder engagement in order to arrive at a budget that is acceptable to all because it leads to a common objective of growing Ghana and growing our people. Under these people, the budget is for the president. The president sits around with a group of people and then they decide that what Ghanaians are looking for is A, B, or C. And when they come and you challenge the budget, they call you names because you are reckless, you are unpatriotic, and that all you want to do is to take power. But that is not the tenets of developing a budget. I would like to point out in the course of this conversation that whilst our peers were busily managing their economies and trying to ensure that the economies were resilient and could face whatever headwinds such as COVID-19, who were in Ghana developing budgets that were to serve the private interests of the managers of the economy. So the budgets of yesterday's and the budget of today has been focused extensively on how the managers of the economy will go home with better pension, with better businesses, and with better wealth at the expense of the people who elected them into office. Even the so-called E-Levy, the main cause of the resistance is not that E-Levy should be implemented at all costs. The main resistance is because some 240 million a year over a period of three years, culminating is almost 800 million, will be lost to some group of people who want that money badly than you. So even in that sense, they are not thinking about you. They are thinking about themselves. So whilst they are taking 1.7% from you, they are paying themselves 4%. That is the kind of people we are dealing with. And it is the reason we are in the quagmire that we are. And today, even though it's a brief program, I will try to illustrate to you some of the challenges that we are facing and how those challenges are self-inflicted and cannot be addressed in one year. I will show you that in an attempt to deal with years of misappropriation and misapplication of resources, they want to solve all the five-year programs in 2022. Economics is not an event. It's a process. You don't develop an economy in one stroke of the pen. If you agree that the Ghanaian economy was ravaged by COVID-19 and the economy only could grow by 0.4%, what you're admitting is that for a greater part of the year, the Ghanaian worker was sitting at home and was not working. What you're admitting that for a greater part of the year, the Ghanaian businessman was just feeding on his capital and not generating anything. What you're admitting is that the poor farmer had a challenge growing food for the family. Now, having admitted all of that, you now come with a stick in hand and say, you must go in and bring the last that is left of you because I need a revenue. That is not how you manage an economy. If I put together the numbers, you will notice that in two years, this government wants to take 72 billion Ghana cities from Ghanaians after COVID. That figure, it's more than the total revenue we generated in 2019. How can an economy that gave you 55 billion in one year suddenly give you almost 72 billion in one year? More than what you collected in a whole year should be generated as additional revenue in one year. Clearly, this is an insensitive government. And this is a government that has lost its way. So if you could show me the first uh, table I would like to show you how our revenue dynamics have evolved. And you will find that in 2021, the government anticipates that by the close of the year, which is that a couple of weeks away, it would have generated 55 billion. That will mean that even in the midst of COVID and all the challenges we had that we needed to be supported to come out of it, they still bulldoze their way, put their hands in our pocket, and two 24 billion more. So if you are hungry and you are looking for food, now share abuaya fwa ono so kura unti minyano jiso okunu kwa. The people struggled and your economy was only 0 0.4. Who introduces austerity in the midst of a devastating economic crisis? You don't do that. You rather support them to come out. But these people still took 24 billion more from us. In 2022. They expect to grow the revenue to 80 billion, 
That means an additional 45 billion in one year. I cannot imagine this group of people. If you put the two together, that is 2021 after COVID and 2022 after COVID, you are getting in excess of, um, you are getting almost 69 to 70 billion. Look at the figures they were generating in 2019 before COVID. They were generating only 42 billion. In fact, they are trying to double the revenue in one year after COVID. So quite clearly, you can see that this is a very insensitive government. But you also see that the growth is so astronomical. And here I'll tell you why they are cooking these numbers. You see, those of us who were trained as chartered accountants we were taught that your numbers will be audited. And we were taught that you needed to be transparent and open as possible with your numbers because you never know when you find an auditor sitting in front of you whose dresses are completely peeled. It's been washed for almost 10 years. You see the shoe is completely worn. And when you put 100 million on the table, he quotes a version of the Bible. That is when you know you are nearer in Sawam. So these people do not know that one day they'll find that auditor and they'll be heading to Insawam. But it is because the international investor is saying that what type of economy are you running that all the time you are boring without end? So now they want to tell them, oh, we can collect 45 billion more. So trust us. No sensitive person who has looked at the trajectory of your history and your performance over the last four years suddenly will believe in a magical number in 2022. If you look at the growth numbers for our revenues over the period that they've been there, you will see that they have never even done 30 billion before. So how can you do 45 billion in one year? And it is the reason we are in this crisis of the revenue measure that they are trying to introduce. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at expenditure, and I'm very happy that General spoke to the expenditures. His Excellency John Dramani Mahama left office with our wage bill at almost 14 billion. We'll recall that this 14 billion was a struggle because that was the time we had introduced the single spine. And there were several demands that we needed to meet. And we did 14 billion. Fast forward 2019. And we're doing almost, let's say about 2020, we're doing a double of the wage bill. And yes, workers did not see increase in their revenue, in their, in their salaries. Workers did not see improvement in their conditions of service. So this doubling of the wage bill to 28 billion by 2019, uh, 2020, who did they pay? Who did they pay? Champions of ghost names. You remember there was a time Ken of Oriata said that Somehow or another, he had killed all the ghosts on the payroll and has saved us 46 million, isn't it? Or was it 460 million thereabout? Two weeks later, we saw all the ghosts resurrecting and asking for their monies. <laughs> it is only under this government. So they doubled the wage bill by 2020. And next year, they are doing almost 35 billion. Who does that? So clearly, you are not managing the economy. If you are managing the economy, what you focus on is to build a lean and efficient public sector that can provide the enabling environment for the private sector to thrive and absorb these people as unemployed. But you know, when they came, the only option was that they would just look at the public sector and put people there. Now it has caught up with them, where they are now spending close to almost, uh, what do you call it? You can see they are now spending almost close to uh, 35 billion just to pay workers. And that is the biggest challenge. And they are not paying workers because workers' salaries have improved. You recall that it came to a head when they refused to pay for a whole year an adjustment. And subsequently, when the heat became loud, they decided to give, uh, give about 4%, isn't it? That was when they said these were the 4% uh, 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 office holders. You know. So these are the people who have mismanaged our economy. Look at how much we are spending on, on uh, interest payments. And again, you see that if you put interest payment and that of the, uh, what do you call it, that of wages and salaries together, you will find that they are spending almost 70 billion Ghana cities. So the, the 70 billion they are taking from you is not for us. The 70 billion that they're asking you to pay in one year, even though you are ravaged by COVID, 
It's not because they're going to build hospitals. It is because they want to use it to finance their mess, which is the unregulated expansion of the public sector and the effect of the unreasonable expansion in our public debt, which must be paid for. If you put the two together, that is where they're asking us to pay e-levy to be financed. It is not to finance economic development. But you will find in the next slides that if you look at where they are spending the money, and here I wanted to focus on just discretionary expenditures. Discretionary expenditures are expenditures that you can cut. You may say that we cannot immediately cut the wage bill because the workers have already been employed and they cannot go home. That is fair. You can say that your interest payments are obligations owed to people we borrowed from and we need to pay them. That is fair. But look at discretionary expenditures. You are expanding your discretionary expenditures by 27 billion Ghana cities. This is expenditure you don't need and you can cut in order to save the people of Ghana. So why do you pursue Ghanaians for 6.9 billion? And create the impression that without that e-levy of 6.9 billion, somehow you'll be going to IMF. Meanwhile, you are incurring a discretionary additional expenditure to 2021 of 27 billion. Nobody knows what you are using that money for. If I were a good manager of the economy, that is where I would target. Because I already have the base of my goods and services from 2021. This 27 billion plus other ex discretionary expenditures, including uh, what do you call it, other payments that they need to make, you are doing about 27 billion on top of the previous year. Clearly, this is not somebody who is interested in us. It's because this 27 billion, a lot of it is going to some people's homes. I said it's going where? It's going to some people's homes. So when they cut it, Ghanaians will be better, but they may be worse because the money they need is sitting here. In fact, the 241 will be sitting here. So they won't cut it. But I also want you to look at the argument they've been making that it is because they are doing a lot of interesting things. That's why they are taking a lot of money and borrowing more. So you find them say that we have flagship programs, uh, 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 what, free SHS. Then you hear them talk about uh, uh, one village, one dam, even though they have not had the courage to go and commission one of them. <laughs> they talk about one district, one factory, and ended up painting people's factories. All the things they've talked about, the year of rose, you start, what have you, put them all together. Since 2017 to 2020, as you can see there, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia would have spent 530 billion Ghana cities. Not even 10% of that can be found in the flagship programs. So in 2017, when they took 51 billion, they spent only 2 billion on flagship programs. In 2018, when they took 59 billion, they spent just about 7.6. 2019, when they took 9.2 billion, they spent only 70. Then 2020, when they collected almost 100 billion, they spent only 7.7. 2021, they expanded to 111 billion and only spent 9.1. Now in 2022, they are taking 137 billion and they are spending only 9 billion on flagship programs. So clearly, this is not why they are taking our money. The money is going somewhere else. Now look at some of the expenditure dynamics. How can somebody who doesn't have money move from 70 billion of expenditure to 100 billion, 30 billion in one year? That is almost 60% growth in your expenditure in one year. Then the following year, you increase expenditure again to 111. If you want to start from 2019 where we didn't have COVID, so that we'll recover from COVID by going back and doing the things we're doing to grow the economy, you would have already added something in the region of 41 billion to our original expenditures when we didn't have COVID. It is only a reckless family head that does that. That you don't have the money, but the people must go through hell for you to live lavish lives. Because all these monies I'm quoting, if indeed it was for the people of Ghana, 
We won't be insulted for our roles that are not fixed. And when we go on demonstration, they say intelligent. Those who have been to school shouldn't demonstrate. Eh? If these monies were spent to fix our schools, our children will not be doing double track. In fact, if this money was spent to address unemployment problem, we will not be talking about a scam you start that will only create jobs for a period of three years of one million. And I'll be explaining that even that is a big scam. So quite clearly, these people need to cut down the expenditures quite significantly. And it is the first place to look at and not to burden people who have just emerged from COVID and are struggling to find a new way of putting their lives together. Now you are not even going beyond that. You see, some of the things, sometimes I don't want to say them because my big brother is involved. But when you look at Ghanaians and you say that we are in a country of 30 million people, only 1.6 percent, uh, 1.6 million people pay taxes. So you want my three-year-old daughter to pay tax because he's sitting in that 30 million. Eh? Where, where are the Legon guys? You are in that 30 million. So you see how they are short-sighted. In fact, the other day, Ghana Revenue Authority said that they have now expanded the tax base by almost 15 billion because everybody that holds a Ghana card now has a 10 number. So that net that you are saying is 17 million. Is it Adwa that is in that net? Or it is Amani? Because all these unemployed youth that killed the roads all over the place are holding Ghana card. So you don't talk about widening the tax base because somebody is caught because you force him to go and take a Ghana card, even if he's unemployed. You talk about deepening the tax net. And deepening the tax net is to find those that you have caught, how many of them are edible, so that you can leave the money and the small ones. Because those are not edible, isn't it? Then you can take the, the big ones. That is why we talk about deepening the tax net. So if you go and put up a machine at NIA and you are forcing people to register and you have 20 people and you are claiming that 20 people have 10 numbers, you are grouping in the dark because those people include unemployed children who don't even earn a living and you are counting them as part of your tax net. When you allow people who are not scrutinized, who have not been clearly analyzed properly for their competences, to allow you to experiment with the people of Ghana. What you do is to mess up a whole generation of the youth. And that is why our children cannot find jobs. But I want to also let you look at the con men approach to taking monies from us. And you will see at the top there, I just said, let's look at the flagship projects that they are bragging about. You start, is that, didn't they say you start? One billion. When they talk about 10 billion, ignore it because you see, after the, 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 the text, the English, in fact, you can write 100 billion in the, in the text. But what matters is how much of that 100 billion have you provided for in your fiscal tables as expenditure that we must approve? So we are not interested in the being English, you are writing and 10 billion and who this man will support. We are not interested. We are interested in what have you really told us we should approve for you. And what they have told us to approve is what you see there. Eh? You start, government of Ghana, 385 million. 6.9 billion that they are telling you will create how many jobs is only 385 million. The rest, 640 million, they are going to hope that some benevolent development partner will give us that money because it is Akufado who is managing Ghana. So all this 6.9, and the use that they came to talk about is that only 385 million Ghana cities of our taxes that they are collecting. Taxes in excess of 70 billion for two years, only 385 million is going there. If this is not a scam, what is this one? So let them deceive you, leg on boys, and go and start and see who will save you. You start, or see you start. Who started in Yamba? This is a scam. Look, agenda 111, 580 million Ghana cities. And yet they will climb on top of the trees and tell you agenda 111 and how it is going to change the face of healthcare. 580 million. What can you build? What can you build? 580 million Ghana cities. Capex, Rose, 
They will tell you that they are collecting this money because they want to build roads. If you are going to build roads, your budget is 1.7. Out of that 1.7, only 1 billion is supposed to be financed from taxes. The other 690 million is financed from our oil money. So, if this is what you need, when I put them together, they are not even up to 2 billion. So, why are you taking 6.9 from us? 11. Are you seeing the picture? Call them for who they are. Scorn, they are just con men. When they want to give you a bitter pill, they know you won't like to swallow it, so they will find something, a sweetener to sugarcoat it. So this 385 million, they just slaughtered it there. Make sure that the narrative in the budget is so enticing that you are looking at 10 billion. Then when they come to the budget, they go and put 385 million Ghana cities. And you and I are fighting because when Isaac Adongo and his team realize that this is a scam, and they are asking you how you take almost 70 billion and you are spending only 385 million on the most vulnerable aspect of our life, which is unemployment. And you are exploiting our vulnerability in order to take more of our money. In fact, if you look at 384 million, what they are taking is more than 50% of what they are spending on the children because the 240 million from e levy, if you subtract it from 385 million, in fact, they are seriously competing with unemployment in order to fill their pockets. These are the group of people we are dealing with. I can see Sami is looking at me, so I will rush. <laughs> My next two uh, slides. <coughs> Debt service. When His Excellency John Romani Mama was leaving office, we were spending approximately 66% of our tax revenue to service our public debt. So a government of the time when we handed over to them had about 34% of fiscal space in order to manage the economy. And in managing an economy, it's not just about the growth, it's about being prepared for what we call the headwinds. COVID has come. You have to be ready that one day something unexpected would happen. And you must manage the economy to build the resilience and the buffers so that when that day arrives, you are able to deal with it and deal with it efficiently. Unfortunately, these people, you can see, by 2019, they were already doing 73% of debt service. This one was a COVID. Was it COVID? That's why I said these people, they should thank COVID. Like, but now we'll see their hands, excuse my language. Like, but now Baumia cannot walk in town. COVID. Now, 2020, 87%. Even when they are trying to break our neck, they are still doing 82%. So all that they are saying is that break your back, give me the money, I'll use it to go and pay debt. Who generated the debt? Akufado, Baumia, and Ken Oforiata. How can you go and pick somebody who made money through borrowing and lending to come and lead your borrowing regime. And when he was coming, he was coming with his own company in the back. And you expect not to be here. So that is the problem. You know now they don't talk about debt to GDP again, you remember? And here again, if somebody is closer to Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, I want to start a conversation he started and ran away from. You know, when they came to power, they were busy talking about rate of debt accumulation, isn't it? Rate of debt accumulation. Econs 101 will tell you the rate of debt accumulation is an immediate, intermediate measure of debt sustainability. And at nowhere do you focus on debt sustainability by calculating rate of debt accumulation. You know why? If I was doing 300% rate of debt accumulation, but I could spend just 20% of my tax revenue to pay that debt. And you do 0% debt accumulation, but you are spending 87% of your tax revenue to pay that debt. As an economist, who is a better manager of the economy? So they have deceived themselves with rate of debt accumulation. Ah, 
when we collect the taxes, we can't even use it for anything other than go and give to foreigners. It is the reason the foreigners are very angry at our economy. Because we can't go and take their money and be cooking the books. IMF says this, you say this. How can you be fighting with IMF in terms of integrity and credibility of numbers? But this is the kind of economy we are dealing with. Deficit and primary balance. <clears throat> Again, I want you to look at what IMF has been saying. Don't listen to these people's numbers. Though. It is those numbers the capital market used, and now they are dumping our bonds like uh, some leprosy. Go to the next. Deficit. 2017, they did 4%. 2018, 6.8. 2019, 7.2. COVID wasn't there yet, though. 2020, 15.7. 2021, they are still doing about 14.5 NDA. And even 2022, 2023, 2024, will continue to be in double digit deficit. Even when they are breaking our back, because they are keeping all those funny expenditures there, we are paying for the waste, but we are still accumulating more public debt because we need to borrow more in order to do double-digit deficit. This is not sustainable. And the sooner they stop this, the better it is for the future of our children. But the last one I want to leave you with, I want you to understand that COVID did not only attack Ghana. Did COVID attack only Ghana? Or Ghanaians who were just, were, God was against us. COVID attacked everybody, is that not it? Let's look at how our peers fed before COVID, and after COVID. And you will see how these people should leave this country as managers of the economy a couple of years back, not 2024. So you see Ghana, an outlier, the worst performer. See the yellow line. That is your dear country, the laughing stock of the West African community. In terms of deficit, which is this side of the equation, whilst Ghana did 6.8 in 2018, 7.2 in 2019, 15.7 in 2020, 14.5 in 2021, and are projecting to continue double digit. Benin, our neighbor just across the corner here, we're doing 3%. 2019, we were at 7.2, they were doing uh, 0.5, 4.7. Even COVID, COVID, almighty COVID, they were doing 4.5. COVID, no, even COVID, they did about 4.7. Post-COVID, they are now moving back to about 2% and 2.5%. Bonnie Ben What is our crime? We will sit here and we say that we are developed than Benin. They will come and take our country away and we will now move and take visas to go and be in Benin because they won't let us come in free. With this kind of attitude, we will go and finish their country. Look at Burkina Faso. The people who are running away from rebels where their parliament cannot even work peacefully. Look at what they are doing. 4.4, 3.4, 5.7, 5.6. Almighty COVID, they did 5.7. And we were roaming at 15 point something percent. Cote d'Ivoire. And I like Cote d'Ivoire because Akufado likes to compare. And the presidents are almost around the same age. So they should be able to work alike. <laughs> so you see Cote d'Ivoire, 2.9. In 2018, 2.3, even almighty COVID, they did 5.6, and they are now going back to almost 3% in the medium term. The Gambia, the people just held election the last time. Even in the almighty COVID, they did 2.1, and they have never gone past 5.7. If you continue, you can see the list for yourself. Look at the other side. Public debt is scary. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been living with a group of people who should be the last person to go near the public purse. These people are the enemies of our public purse. And the onslaught on our public purse leads me to believe that Ghana is on the way to being a failed state if we don't take these people out of government. And that the future of our children is so compromised that Ghana's death trajectory and our, the health of our fiscals will be said that in a few years' time, we will have to sell Ghana in order to survive. Already, Esla is gone. They've used it to go and borrow. Bauxite, the one we are yet to mine, is already gone. 
I don't even know whether Akufuado has ever seen that bauxite buried there. But he's already collected monies on it. Get fun. The almighty get fun that was building schools and was the savior of our educational system is now a debt processing factory. So what get fun now does is collect the money that will pay as levies. Go and spend 80% of that to pay debt and leave 20% just to pay salaries and administrative costs. No schools are going to be built anymore. That is where we are. They wanted to take the last one, which is the mineral royalties. The Ajapa. This one is Jabba. And you know, they always find very sweet names. You know the name they gave to the vehicle they are using for get fun. Dachi. That's a Dachi. And the Dachi, when you look inside, you see Ken of company with a bag, borrowing and collecting fees and commission. My own brother, my former lecturer, is Ankuma. You see his firm hanging there, collecting fees. That's why they are all quiet. Because we were told, he taught me that when you are conflicted in a matter, or when you are eating and your mouth is full, you don't talk. Otherwise, a better row. <laughs> so, they have now joined the silent voices, but very busy on the table. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, E. Levy, I don't want to talk about it because you can see all the descriptions. Drop E. Levy. You can see bank transfer. How can you tax bank transfer? How? How on F can you tax bank transfer? What, Eosika? Is bank transfer revenue? Or it is profit? How can you be taxing people's capital? Restore benchmark values. And here I want to speak to our importers. You know, I have the advantage of serving on the Trade Industry and Tourism Committee. And we had petitions upon petitions about the benchmark value. Here again, that is the scorn and the scam of these people. You recall when they came with the other one, moving from taxation to production. Now it is production to taxation. That was so kind people were jubilating because they had removed import duty 1%. You remember that? Good. A simple budget. Good. You know what they did? After they removed the 1%, they now went to the port and decided to give every item that you import their own value. We call it the commissioner's value. And commissioner's values are exceptional values. You call on the commissioner's valuation when there's an invoice that is under invoice and you feel that this is not a true reflection of the cost of that item. Then the commissioner uses his mandate to give evaluation. We call it a commissioner's valuation. These people went there and gave every item the commissioner's valuation and increases said that when the Bosu Okai people go to pay the 2%, when they look at the figures, the 2% becomes almost 5%. What type of 2% is that? So if you were paying 3% on 100 Ghana, they increase it to 200 Ghana. So you now pay 2% and you are paying two, three times what you would have paid even with the 3%. So when these people give you one CD in the hand, in the left, be sure to look at the right before you collect it. Because they will take 10 times from the right. And that is why the issue about benchmark valuation is an issue of injustice and a criminal conduct of government to rob the people who trade at the port. So to say that you are reversing it means that you are going back to the robbery you visited on them a couple of years ago. You need to go back and sit at the table and arrive at the appropriate rate they would have been paying if you indeed gave them 1% and it was level 2%. But to go back will mean that you still want them to pay 5%, 6%, when in your records, they are supposed to be paying 2%. So ladies and gentlemen, I think Sami Jemfi, next time you are bringing me to a program like that, give me two hours. <laughs> because Let me take my time and let you see the scam. Fortunately, I was trained to be transparent by these people. On the day of recording, you and I will be at the gate and we will give them the flogging of their lives.